um, my name is Ikolile and today I'm just going to be giving you guys a brief overview on just some important aspects that you guys need to kind of focus on before going to your test, um, whether it's spot or long questions, but then weren't specified, weren't told rather of whether you guys are writing spot or your long question based papers. So I'm just going to give you guys a more long, long question um, overview, you know, because um, I feel like if you if you really confident in in answering your long questions, then sports should naturally come to you. Because I believe that when you study um, for long questions, you're technically already studying for sports. Because then you need to see what you're studying. So if you're studying for long questions, you're technically already studying for sport. Because then you're gonna be using both your um, your notes, whether it's cleaner net, whether it's your lecture slides, and also your um, and also your atlas so in so to be able to see what you're studying so cool the first thing we're going to talk about is your something called your dermatones um dermatones is usually a concept that's usually overlooked and they could possibly ask you it does come up every now and then it does come up every now and then so with the okay just before we start i just want to clarify that so i'm not going to be going into debt information like i'm not going to go into um into deep information because then I feel like that really won't be useful because I can't be out here um, reading what the textbook says. So what I'm going to be doing is that I'm just going to be giving you guys a brief overview and how you should you should study something and what is the best approach and what is most likely going to be information that's going to be asked. asked. So um, yeah, I, I hope this is going to be useful and yeah, cool. So the first thing we're going to talk about, like I said, is going to be your dermatones. So dermatones actually refers to what? Definition of your dermatones are certain are nerves that actually have cutaneous innovation. So what this actually means is that it's actually nerves that actually then innovate your skin. And these nerves actually originate from the products of your brachial plexus. So your brachial plexus actually gives off, of course, um, you guys should know this already, it gives off your five branches. And then within those five branches, as they travel through your upper limb, as they travel through your upper, upper limb, they actually end up having certain branches which eventually end up um, innovating parts of your skin. Right. So one of the, f so with this thing, I'm just going to mention that you guys should actually not overlook this. It's something that you guys should actually kind of um, spend like a young 30 minutes or like an hour in and just invest some time, in, in, some time into it. Um, I'm just going to name like a few examples because then what I realize about the dermatones is that they make sense, you know. So the, the definition or the name of a certain nerve is relative, is completely relative to where it's found. Let's think of how anatomy technique is. If you look, if you really pay attention, you realize that the names of um, certain, um, the names of certain muscles or certain nerves describe where they're going to be found, right? So... I'm just gonna name like a few dermatones um, just to prove my point of how the name of the dermatones actually tell you where they actually are. So for instance, your lower your lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, you know? So it's technically found it's technically found at the lower lateral cutaneous part of the arm. You do know that your arm is divided now into, into your arm and your forearm and your hand. Right? That's your upper limb. The upper limb is divided into your to your arm, your forearm, and also your hand. Right. So when you look at your forearm, when you look at your forearm, forearm is technically, I mean, when you look at your arm, your arm is technically where your, um, your, your biceps are, right? So the definition of this is that it's found on the lower, so you're going to go like lower part of your arm, the lateral, so you're going to go in the more to like the lateral side. And then it's cutaneous because then all of these things are actually cutaneous innovations. So for instance, this dermatone's name is lower cutaneous, lower lateral cutaneous of the arm. So it's going to be found at the lower part, at the lateral side of your arm. No, and then you also have to know the origin of where these dermatomes actually come from. So again, for instance, your lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm actually originates from where? From your radial nerve. We're going to be focusing on here is that we're going to be focusing on your brachial plexus and also the lymphatic drainage of the female breast. So what I want to emphasize here specifically is the importance of knowing how to draw your brachial plexus. It is extremely, extremely, extremely important to know how to draw your brachial plexus. In some point in your second year life, you are going to be asked to draw your brachial plexus. If you guys have not drawn it um, yet, you're going, you're definitely still going to draw your brachial plexus. 
And by draw your brachial plexus, what I mean is that you'd be, you should be able to mention how your brachial plexus actually starts from your roots, goes to your trunks, goes to divisions, goes to your cords, and then goes to your branches. And then it should end with your five branches. It's extremely important to also know where your roots actually originate from. The fact that they originate from your C5, C6, C7, C8, and your T1. And you should also be able to mention the fact that your roots are actually found between your anterior and your medial scalene muscles. It's also very important to be able to mention your supraclavicular and also your infraclavicular um, branches. So what this actually includes is the branches. See those small branches that you might think of ignoring? Those branches are actually very important. Branches like your long thoracic nerve, branches like your long thoracic nerve, branches like your dorsal scapular nerve. Those are branches that you really might opt to ignore, but you should not. You should also be able to know them and be able to include them in your drawing. Um, what's most important about your brachial plexus is, of course, your branches. These branches actually include, you should be able to also name your branches in order. It means, what I mean by that, you should be able to name them from your lateral to your medial side. So for instance, the most lateral is going to be your muscular cutaneous nerve. Then from there, it's going to be your auxiliary nerve. Then from there, it's going to be your radial nerve. Then from there, it's going to be your medial nerve and then your ulnar nerve. So what I usually do is that one of the things you actually should know is the path and the, the path of each and every one of these branches. So you should be able to, after drawing your brachial plexus, it's very important to, to implement a system whereby you label or rather you determine the pathway of every nerve from your brachial plexus. So what I mean by that is that you should be able to be um, to be able to identify the pathway of like, for instance, your muscular cutaneous nerve. You should be able to determine that your muscular cutaneous nerve travels um, in this way, is, it travels relative to, your, um, relative to the other cords or, or rather relative to the other branches um, in this position and then pierces this muscle and then after piercing this muscle it actually then divides into this muscle uh, rather, sorry that it divides into um, this nerve and that other nerve but we'll get to that um, we'll get to that later I think because then it's part of it's part of a general understanding of anatomy but yeah I guess we'll get that we'll get to that so I've finished in I've finished um, emphasizing the importance of a brachial nerve. I mean your brachial plexus. Then now we come to a brachial. I mean now come to lymphatic drainage of the female breast. What's actually important to know here is that your your breasts are technically divided. The 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 drainage of your breast is divided now into three systems. Right. First is going to be your auxiliary your auxiliary lymph nodes. And secondly is going to be your, is going to be your parasternal group lymph nodes. And then thirdly is going to be your, your intercostal lymph node. So 75% of your lymph node, 75% of your lymph is drained by your axillary lymph node. 20% is drained by your parasternal group node, group, group lymph node, and 5% is going to be drained by your intercostal lymph node. First, we're going to talk about your axillary um, lymph nodes. So when we come to axillary, um, your axillary is simply your, um, your, your amped. Yeah, your amped. That's technically what your axillary actually is. And when we talk about that, you need to be able to specify and rather be able to label the walls and describe and determine the walls of your axillary. What I mean by this, you should be able to determine what your posterior wall, the anterior wall, the lateral wall, and the middle wall. So for instance, um, the anterior anterior wall of your axillary actually consists of your anterior, anterior axillary fold. The lateral wall of your axillary actually is things like your humerus. Right. So it's actually important to be able to identify the walls of each and every part, you, yeah, of each and every wall of your axilla, and then be able to then determine which lymph nodes are actually found there. So I'm just going to touch quickly on the lymph nodes that you're actually going to find there. So um, your lymph nodes, your axillary lymph nodes are going to be divided into five. You're going to divide into your lateral, your pectoral, your, sub, your subscapular, your central axillary lymph nodes, and your apical lymph nodes. Now your lateral lymph nodes are not really involved in the drainage of your breast. They're more involved in the drainage of your limbs, but they, they form part of your auxiliary um, lymph nodes. And then after that, you're gonna have your pectoral lymph nodes. Your pectoral lymph nodes are actually now found in the medial border of your axilla, found close to the inferior border of the pectoral major, which drains, and rather your pectoral um, lymph, node, lymph node drains most part of your um, lymph. It drains, more, it drains most part of your lymph. 
And after that, you're gonna come to the to the to the axillary lymph nodes that are actually found now in your posterior part. This is, this actually includes your subscapular lymph nodes, and are actually found along the posterior axillary fold and the subscapular vessels. And after that, you're gonna have the central axillary lymph nodes, and these are actually now found deep inside, deep into rather the pectoral major, and are and are associated with the second part of the axillary artery. And then lastly, you're gonna have your apical lymph nodes. And these ones are actually found in the apex, in the apex of the axilla. And then, like I said, after having those axillary lymph nodes, you're then also going to have the other two group lymph nodes, which are your peristernal lymph nodes and your intercostal lymph nodes. But then there isn't much detail to actually know about those. As long as you know the axillary lymph nodes and you know where they're found. And what's also important, you need to actually also know the number of lymph nodes that are actually found at that specific um, group of axillary lymph nodes. You also have to know the number of lymph nodes. This is going to focus mostly on the shoulder joint. Muscles found around the shoulder joint, what the shoulder joint actually consists of, consists of, and and by that I mean like what actually stabilizes the shoulder joint, and also consists now of the, um, and also the rotator cuff muscles, which are going to be a group of muscles which are actually going to be really important. And I feel like it's certain muscles that you should also specifically look at, because they are frequently asked and uh, yeah it would be a good tip to actually look at them like really look at them so i'm just gonna sum like i said i'm just gonna summarize i'm not gonna go into detail i'm just gonna mention some things that should be looked at i feel like it's not gonna be as effective if i if i tell you um I, if i tell you um exactly what's written in the textbook all i can do is just give you a brief summary and just tell you how and what to focus on so, like I said, we spoke about the shoulder joint. What you should know is actually the factors that stabilize now the shoulder joint. This actually includes things like your glenoid labrum and also includes things like your coracochromal coreco arc, right? And you got to look at what actually consists now of your coracochromal coreco arc. This actually includes what your coracoid process, your coracochromal ligament, and, uh, and your acromion process. And you should actually then be able to, de to determine the function of the things that actually consist of your shoulder joint. For instance, your coracal, your coracal acromial arc actually prevents the upward, the upward dislocation of your humerus. Now, the third thing, the, the third thing that's actually found with, that actually stabilizes rather your shoulder joint is going to be the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii, which again, you're going to have to then mention the function. And the function of the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii is to prevent the upward dislocation. And then the final factor is going to be the long head of the triceps brachii, which actually causes now inferior support during abduction. So now we've actually now mentioned the things that actually consist of your shoulder joint, and we should now mention what causes the movement of your shoulder joint. So you do know the basic functions. Heavy abduction, you have your adduction, you have your flexion, you have your ext extension, you have your medial rotation and your lateral rotation, and you have your last one, which is your circumduction. So you should be able to um, to show these movements because then they become very important when it comes to clinical cases. Because then in most, sometimes you're going to receive um, clinical cases and then they're going to tell you what sort of movement is actually inhibited in the patient or what sort of movement, movement is actually abnormal in the patient. And if you know what muscle actually causes that movement, you'll then be able to tell which muscle is actually then um, not functioning properly, if, you, if, if I can put it in those terms. And what causes now the contraction and the movement of your, of your muscles is going to be certain nerves. So if a patient actually comes in with a certain abnormal, um, abnormal um, movement of a part of um, their shoulder, should be able to tell which muscle which muscle rather actually causes that motion and thus if there is an absence of that motion you should be then you should then be able to tell which nerve is actually then ruined um then like i said we're going to talk about the basic movements and you should know what actually causes those movements i'm not going to go through all of them i'm just going to go through like the first three and uh, yeah so for instance with the shoulder you're going to have abduction abduction is actually going to be caused by what your deltoid muscle and also your spring your supra rather your supraspinatus muscle and then your flexion. Flexion again is going to be caused by your deltoid, your, de your deltoid muscle and your pectoralis, your pectoralis major. Lateral rotation is going to be caused by your infraspinatus and your deltoid. Your deltoid. I'm really not going to go through this because I feel like 
it's not really helpful because then you guys are just supposed to you know sit down and then absorb this information but i just want you guys to understand what to look at and how to look at it you know so you look at the movement look at what muscle actually causes that movement and look at what nerve supplies that um that muscle and something that i actually realized that with your long questions you know you probably you most probably not going to be asked um in a i mean not innovation i mean you, you most probably not going to be asked um the attachment so i would suggest you kind of mise attachments and just look at the action and the innovation of the muscles that's if you're going to be given information that your you're going to be writing um, long, long questions like i said in my initial vn i really don't know whether guys are right preparing for sport or for um for um long questions but anyway yeah and then now i'm gonna come to my rotator cuff muscles again what you gotta do is that you gotta understand the muscles and you gotta know the innovation and you gotta know the action of the muscles it's very important and rotator cuff muscles also one of the questions that they actually quite frequently ask so it's very um, crucial that you look at them and you are very comfortable with them i'm just going to mention i'm just going to mention them and just tell you the innovation of the muscles just go ahead and actually look at the at the i'll, okay, I'll tell you the the action just read through the um attachments but if like i said before if you're praying for long questions it's really i would say don't look at the the attachments but rather look at the action and also the innovation so part of the rotator cuff muscle you're going to have just your, your supraspinatus muscle which is going to be again innovated by your, your supra supra scapular um, nerve and your supraspinatus actually causes now the abduction of the shoulder joint then you're going to come out to infraspinatus which is actually then innovated now by your supra scapular nerve and actually causes now your lateral rotation of the arm then you have your teres major your teres minor which is actually then innovated by the axillary nerve and actually causes now the lateral lateral rotation of the lateral rotation of the arm then you come down to your subscapularis which actually causes now the upper which, which actually causes medial rotation and innervated by the upper and the lower subscapular nerves so like i previously mentioned you gotta look at which muscle causes which action and once you know that you'll be able then you'll then be able to tell which nerve is actually then ruined for instance i did mention previously that the muscle um your i did mention that your dead old muscle is actually responsible now for abduction of what of your shoulder so if the patient actually then struggles with abduction you then should know that the axillary nerve is actually um is actually um um ruined or damaged somewhere somewhere and somehow and how you're going to be able to determine where your axillary nerve is actually, is actually then um ruined you're going to look at the pathway of your axillary nerve if you know the pathway of your axillary nerve you then gonna be able to know where the axillary nerve is actually most vulnerable. And what we're gonna be talking about here is your anastasmosis and anastasmosis and your um, boundaries of boundaries and contents of your triangular and your contangular spaces. So first thing we're gonna talk about is your anastasmosis around your scapula. So what this actually then technically means that you have now multiple blood supply to the same area. So this actually happens whereby you're gonna have um, collateral supplies of blood. To a certain area in case one of the one of the blood supplies gets cut off you're still going to have alternative routes to actually end up supplying your um your organ or or your muscle in this case or your scapula in this case um so your anastomosis around your scapula is going to consist now of your three main arteries this actually includes your dorsal scapular artery which actually comes now from the transverse transverse cervical artery so what's actually important here to know is that you need to know the arteries and also where they actually originate from and also the pathway in which they take and also which which muscle they're probably going to go into supply so like i just mentioned your dorsal scapular artery which is a branch of your transverse cervical, cervical artery that's where it actually originates from the pathway is that it actually descends along the medial border of the scapula the branches that they give off is the gives off the infraspinatus um, gives off branches to supply the infraspinatus muscle so you gotta mention what it actually then supplies then your second um branch or a second blood vessel is gonna be the suprascapular artery which is 
which originates from your thyroid cervical trunk and, and is actually found along the superior border superior border of the scapula and actually supplies your supraspinatus muscle and after that you're going to have about your subscapular artery which is a branch of your axillary artery artery and actually supplies your subscapular um, muscle and the branches which it actually then gives off is that it gives off your circumflex scapular artery which actually now goes way to the posterior to supply your infraspinatus um, muscle so that's your anastomosis and after having that anastomosis you're going to then come to the boundaries and contents of your triangular and your conjugular spaces so there's three main types of um, spaces which you're going to find now um relative to your upper limb and you gotta know all these spaces and you gotta know the boundaries of all these spaces and remember one remember I mentioned that it's very important to be able to visually see um it's very important to visually see um these um triangles so that's actually then easier to actually now label them so i'm just gonna briefly touch on them but then you guys should actually go into detail about you're gonna know you're gonna know the boundaries in terms of superior inferior lateral and medially and you're going to have to know the contents of each and every one of those um, spaces so i'm just going to talk about one there's three of them in total your conjugular space your triangular space and lastly you're going to have your your triangular interval it's important to actually know like i said the boundaries the bo the boundaries and the contents of each of them so i'm just going to go through the most important one which is your conjugular space your, con your conjugular space is going to have now your superior border being your teres minor the inferior border being your teres major laterally you're going to find your surgical neck of the humerus medially you're going to find the long head of the triceps brachii and the contents that are going to be found here are also very important which includes things like your um your auxiliary nerve and your um your posterior circumflex um humeral artery so i'm not going to go over the other two because yeah like i just said you just have to know them and yeah and what we're going to quickly discuss here is the importance of understanding of a general understanding of the origin the pathway and the innovation of each and every one of your upper limb um, um nerves so what's very important is that you actually know the innovation of these nerves so for instance we spoke earlier on about your your, your deltoid muscle and how your dead hold muscle actually causes now what your deltoid muscle actually causes now the abduction of what of your shoulder. Your deltoid muscle is actually supplied by what by your auxiliary nerve. So if there's damage now to your auxiliary nerve, there's gonna be an inability to actually move your deltoid muscle. If there's an inability to actually now move your deltoid muscle, thus there won't be any form of abduction of what of your um of your shoulder. That's just like a general understanding that you guys are supposed to to have, because then this is technically how all your clinical cases are actually based. This is the mentality and the understanding in which all your clinical cases are going to be based. So when you talk about the damage of your auxiliary nerve, you got to look at what? You got to look at where your auxiliary nerve are actually going to be found. Okay. So we're talking about your auxiliary nerve. We spoke about how we're now going to talk about the path of your auxiliary nerve. How your auxiliary nerve actually travels through the upper limb and where it's most vulnerable. So your auxiliary nerve starts originates from your posterior cord of your brachial plexus from your c5 and your c6 the main thing you need to know about the auxiliary nerve is that it actually passes through your surgical neck of the humerus so any damage to the surgical neck of the humerus is going to lead to damage of your auxiliary nerve so if you have any form of damage to auxiliary to the surgical neck of your humerus your auxiliary nerve is going to be damaged so thus your innervation of your deltoid muscle is going to be ruined and, in, and which is going to lead to the inability to, to actually then abduct your shoulder. So this is the same mentality that you're supposed to have of all your nerves. I just want you guys to actually emphasize on the origin, the course, the innovation, and what damage to those nerves is actually going to result in. And that's, if you understand that concept, you technically have a very good grasp and understanding of the of how clinical cases of your upper limb work and you are definitely going to get this in your test because then they really do always have these type of questions in your test where they actually apply your knowledge in a clinical case and what we're going to be talking about here is the boundaries and the content 
contents of the cubital fossa. So this is actually very important because in cubital fossa is also one of the things that are actually frequently asked. So it's very important to know the contents of the cubital fossa and also the boundaries of the cubital fossa. So the contents of the cubital fossa actually includes your radial nerve, biceps tendon, brachial artery, and your medial nerve. And all these contents actually are arranged now from your lateral to your medial. Um, and the very easy mnemonic, I don't know how to say the word mnemonic, is a very easy mnemonic to actually remember this by, is really need beer to be at my nicest. So this actually gives you now the contents from your lateral to your medial side. Another important thing you have to know is the is the walls of your um, cubital fossa. And the walls actually include the floor, which consists of your brachialis, the roof, which is your, epi, your eponeurosis, and the lateral wall, which is your brachialis, your brachioradialis, and your medial border. Another thing we're actually going to talk about now is your couple tunnel. So when you come, when you come to a couple tunnel, you have to again, you have to know, you have to know, um, you have to know the the contents and also the boundaries. Just like your, just like with your cubital fossa, the boundaries here also include the roof, which, which consists now of I'm not going to name everything, I'm just going to give you a brief overview, which consists of your flexor and reticulum. Medially, it's going to be your piriform and your floor of your hamate. Laterally, it's going to be your scaphoid and your trapezium. And posteriorly, it's going to be your couple bones. So it's also very important to know the boundaries and be able to draw your couple tunnel. And the contents of your couple tunnel includes things like your flexor, pollicis longus, your median nerve, and your anterior Interiors, inter interiosis artery, anterior interiosis artery. Um, of course, among other things which I'm not going to mention again because I really don't want to be repetitive. It's best if you look at the notes and have a better understanding and full content. I don't want to really be giving out content. It's best if you guys study content by yourself. I'm just going to, I'm just mentioning important things and how you should actually prepare for them. And then another thing is your ulnar canal. Along with your carpal tunnel, you're going to have your ulnar canal. But then your ulnar canal is actually, it's not very frequently asked, but it's, again, it's also very important to know it. And what's actually important here is that the ulnar canal actually consists now of literally what the word actually states, your ulnar artery and your ulnar nerve. And again, you're also going to have to know the walls, the roof, floor, median nerve, I mean the median, medial wall and your lateral wall. And another important thing we're going to know here is your anatomical snuff box. Your anatomical snuff box is actually very important because that's actually where you're going to find your radial artery. That's mostly where you're going to find your radial artery. And it's actually very important when it comes to um, getting your pulse. Again, the anatomical snuff box, you're going to have to know the boundaries and you're going to have to know the contents. Contents include your radial artery, like I said, the superficial branch of your radial nerve and your cephalic vein and also the beginning of your cephalic vein which makes perfect sense actually and the beginning of your cephalic vein so those are the three contents of your um, anatomical snuff box your radial artery superficial branch of your radial nerve and the beginning of your cephalic um, vein so we now come to the last part which is saying your hand and your hand is also very brief because all you have to know here is the muscles, your thinner muscles, your hypothenar muscles, the innervation of your muscles, the action of those muscles. I can guarantee you here you don't actually have to know the inner, the, the attachment. All you got to do is just simply know the types of muscles, the two groups, and the innervation and the function. What's also important here to know is is the superficial is a superficial um, cutaneous um, innervation of your hand that includes your radial muscle sorry that includes your radial nerve median nerve and your ulnar nerve I just want to say if anyone needs any form of um, clarification with anything you guys can contact me via your house com so just just hit up your house com and they'll hit me up and I'll clarify any any misunderstanding or i'll answer i'll answer any form of questions that you guys might actually have and best of luck with the uh, yeah